How do you write an introduction section for a research article that you want to submit to a peer-reviewed journal? Stick around and learn the five keys today on this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up everybody, my name is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh and I want to warmly welcome you to this episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to advance your career in academia. As always, I appreciate the love, so please do take a minute right now to like and share this video with your friends, with your colleagues, with your students. Subscribe to our channel, hit that bell to be able to make sure that you get notifications every week when we end up publishing new content and comment below. You can follow us at these social media accounts. So today we're going to be talking about how it is that you can write an amazing introduction section for an academic research article that you eventually want to submit to a peer-reviewed journal. Writing for academic journals is a challenge. I still remember when I was in grad school, to be honest with you, I thought I was a great writer. I'd always gotten, you know, straight A's in my English classes and an undergrad, you know, writing, you know, thesis-based uh, based articles Se seemed to be pretty straightforward. Oh my gosh, then I got to grad school. It is a different beast. And of course, the higher the impact the journal that you're writing for, the more of a challenge it is to be able to get the tonality right, to be able to make sure your wording is on point. It's really a, a puzzle and you get a lot better at piecing these puzzles together the more experience you have. But especially if this is one of the first times you're doing it, all of us need practical guidance uh, and I have found that other than uh, certain books which you can read, some of them are really lengthy, or just uh, you know, trial and error, which was really what it was for me. It's just over and over again getting rejected until finally getting stuff accepted until the point where I was having first author stuff published in very high impact journals. But it took forever. It wasn't something where I was naturally good at it. It certainly wasn't something that uh, anybody sat me down and kind of took me through point by point and told me how to do, which would have been amazing. But what I want to talk to you about today is one specific part of scientific research articles, and this is the introduction section, which is arguably one of the most dreaded sections of writing publications specifically because a lot of people feel that there is a, a lack of structure in terms of, you know, methods or results. Usually there's a bit more structure, even the discussion section, but the intro remains kind of a slippery section, uh, as you might say. But what I have found is that it doesn't matter how long or how short an intro section is, you always need to be telling the reader five things. And so what I'd like to do is to go through those five things, tell you a little bit about each, and how I would recommend that you structure an intro. The first thing that you need to communicate in your introduction section is me saying this is the reader. Why should I care? There are tens of thousands of articles coming out in fields that are either yours or very similar to yours every single month. Why should I care enough to be able to read your article? Now, this seems like kind of a pompous thing for a reader to say, but understandably, people have very little time to be reading stuff. I mean, as an academic, even in my last field of forensic psychology, in my very tiny little baby niche of risk assessment, which is where you predict the likelihood of future violence, we had over 100 articles being published every single year in over 150 journals that we were hunting through every single month. So it can be really difficult to stay up to date on the research literature, let alone once you find all the articles to read all of them. No one is doing that. So you need to make the case really early why it is that the topic that you're addressing in your article is a big enough deal for a reader to want to, to delve into with you and your authorship team in the piece. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about two different journals. One of them is called the British Journal of Psychology, uh, Psychiatry, so the BJP, and the other one is called Criminal Justice and Behavior. Just two different journals, right? One more general, obviously, in psychiatry, one much more niche in terms of criminology, forensic mental health. So. Criminal Justice and Behavior is a good journal. Uh, when you go and you take a look at pieces in it, these introduction sections can literally go on for dozens of pages. You can have like a 50 page article in Criminal Justice and Behavior. They can be huge. Versus British Journal of Psychiatry in the instructions for authors specifically states that you can only have a one 
paragraph introduction. I remember the first time that I was writing an invited piece for British Journal of Psychiatry. It's got a great impact factor and it's very widely read. So I was like, wow, this is a great opportunity. But I mean, it was a challenge. How on earth am I supposed to write a one paragraph introduction section? So remember, it doesn't matter how long or how short something is in terms of an intro, the length. These five things need to be communicated. So the first one is, again, why should I care? So for that piece, I started with the first sentence. Now in some cases, maybe a whole first paragraph, but for me, again, I didn't have the space. So I only had one sentence. So I said something like, given the world's increasing prison population, which is growing in over 70% of countries, the prediction of future offending is a major public health and safety issue. And I gave a really high impact reference uh, which was an, an international epidemiological study. And so that's what I, what I ended up saying. But it's communicating that big idea, the big idea that you should really care about this. Because what I'm about to tell you is something that is a huge issue. So that's the first thing that I want you to communicate. It could be an entire paragraph just on that. And I'll have another uh, video that I'll link in the description below, which is all about if you have multiple sources that you could cite, which one should you pick? What are the guidelines that you should use when choosing which to pick? So I'll, I'll link that in the description below here. So after you've established why it is that a reader should care, the second obvious question is, okay, establish for me what's been done already. Obviously, very rarely you're gonna start an entirely new research literature or a whole new field, it's not gonna happen. So what's been going on in the past on a given topic? So for example, let's say that I'm writing an article and this article is about uh, predicting violence uh, in uh, people who have been in a mental institution, right? So a mental hospital. Okay, fair enough. First paragraph or the first sentence, whatever it may be, is going to talk about how uh, violence in mentally ill populations is a major public health and safety issue. Boom. I'm giving you the big level epidemiological, national, international statistics to be able to prove that point. Bam. Made that point. Okay, now I know it's an issue. What's been done already? So then I can talk about maybe there's some systematic reviews that have been published or meta-analyses, which are a kind of quantitative syntheses of the existing research literature. You wanna look into those because they're great things to be able to cite. And they're gonna give you a sense of all the trends and patterns in the field. And this way you can say, well, you know, there's been a, a very large research literature that's been published on this topic. Uh, and there are a variety of different risk and protective factors for predicting future violence, which have been identified and studies. These have recently been combined into so-called risk assessment tools, which are structured checklists for the prediction of violence in these populations. And the most uh, popular of these is the Historical Clinical Risk Management 20, or the HCR 20, studies of which have identified it as being an accurate and reliable measure. Reference, reference, reference. Okay, so there you go. That's what's already been done. Number two, what's already been done? You just established it. Number three is after you've kind of reviewed that extant literature, obviously you wouldn't be writing a new article unless there was some problem with what's already out there. You wouldn't just say, well, here's everything that's already out there. Everything's already been done. So I just figured I'd you know, repeat something. No, you're doing something unique. So the third thing that you need to establish is what's the problem with what's already been done in this literature? So for example, I may say that even though the HCR 20 is the most commonly used instrument, there's been no previous uh, research that's been done on establishing its accuracy in people diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder order or FASD. Again, that could be one sentence. It could be a whole paragraph where then I go into defining what FASD is, talking about the criminological literature on FASD and why the HCR 20 may be something valid to test in this population. So again, could be a sentence, could be a paragraph. Some people would have several pages on that, but it's all establishing the same thing, which is what's the problem with the existing research literature. The fourth thing that you need to establish is how are you going to address 
this problem that you've just identified. So again, usually this is going to come towards the end of the intro, but it could be a sentence, it could be a paragraph, and so forth. And so to use that HCR20 example, you may say, the aim of this study was to evaluate the accuracy of the HCR20 in 150 uh, patients in a secure forensic hospital diagnosed with FASD, followed for three years prospectively in the hospital. Done. Fantastic. That's how you're going to address it. The problem was that there was no previous literature on the tool with the population. There you go. You're just going to fix it. Done. And finally, number five, okay, now we know what you're going to do. What do you expect to find? It's important to lay out your hypotheses right up front and then to test them and then to end up seeing what you get. Do your findings actually match your hypotheses or do you find something completely different than what you were expecting to find? That does happen. People wait too often, they'll connect the study, get the data set, they'll mine the data, they'll just you know analyze the data every which way and then just cherry pick out what findings they want to report. But in actuality, what you should be doing in terms of the scientific process is establish the hypotheses, test them specifically, and then report on your findings, whether they're statistically significant or not. Uh, unfortunately, that, that really doesn't happen all that often, which I know sounds wild, uh, but in academia, you know, my goal in this series with you guys is always to be very transparent in terms of what happens within academia. It's one of the reasons why there's now this call for a registration process. So you will actually publish your research protocol and hypotheses in a journal, which agrees to accept your article after you've done the study. But because of that, you can't test 15 different hypotheses. You can't test the data in a whole bunch of ways that you don't already have in your published protocol. So I think that's really good. So again, using our example with the HCR20, we may say uh, that you know we hypothesize that the HCR20 will uh, produce comparable, le comparable levels of accuracy for patients diagnosed with FASD specifically as they have in previous studies which have used forensic inpatient samples. Boom! Done. There you go. That literally could be five sentences, which is your entire intro for Bureau of uh, for Bureau for the British Journal of Psychiatry. There you go. You're done. All right, y'all, thank you so much for watching this brief episode. I want to hear from you in the comments below. Are you preparing an academic manuscript for submission to a peer-reviewed journal right now? And if so, what's it on? Does your introduction section already meet these five different criteria that we've just discussed today? And if there's any other key points you think that really across fields, a scientific... Uh, intro should include, then please do share with us below. We're all part of one big community uh, and it'll be a wonderful experience to, to all get to know one another a little bit better in the comments. And as always, if you have a particular topic you want us to address on a future episode of Navigating Academia, just let us know and we'll be sure to listen to your feedback and get those going for you, especially if you get a whole bunch of likes on your idea. Don't forget to take a moment right now to like and share this video with your friends, colleagues, and students. Subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one career coaching and mentoring, please send a one-hour consultation call with me via the website below. And let's talk a little bit about the piece that you're putting together and how we can maximize the likelihood of its publication before you even submit it. Signing off, everybody. Have a great day, and remember to get out there, take chances, and be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here, as always. If you enjoyed this video, and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.